So, thank you so much for having me here, Jessica and I. I'm really pleased. I almost wasn't able to make it, and so serendipitously it all worked out. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested to follow the presentations that have been made here today. Uh, there's a number of different intersections and ways in which they dovetail with our work. Um, and I've also taken away uh, a number of different interesting perspectives and lessons already. So I'm the Deputy Executive Director of an organization called Peace Dividend Trust. And we build markets, mainly in conflict and post-conflict economies, but also in crisis and post-crisis economies. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, the genesis of our organization and how we got from where we were when we started to where we are today. And then I'll go in a little bit more about our model, um, our theory of change, uh, and um, our impacts. So PDT was founded in 2004. Uh, it was founded on the premise that planning and delivery of aid and development assistance in conflict and post-conflict countries was not reaching its intended beneficiaries at the pace that it could um, or that it should. And this was mainly due to a lot of recreation of the wheel and other kinds of inefficiencies that were happening uh, both at capital and on the ground. So PET as an organization set out to identify the opportunities where the international community could really significantly increase its impact on the ground by just slightly changing some of the traditional ways in which it operates. And while we were able to identify a number of different possibilities, one in particular um, offered the most potential to us and was the most compelling, and that was local procurement. It doesn't sound very sexy probably, but. <laughs> uh, and, and let me just give you a little bit of background about that, although it's come up several times in the other presentations as well. Uh, in crisis and post-crisis countries, the international community traditionally relies on foreign goods and services to carry out its operations. In fact, we found through rigorous research that as little as 5 to 30% of, of budgets actually reach the countries that they are intended to help. Everything else goes offshore. <coughs> so while critical services are provided and infrastructure <coughs> is rebuilt, which is obviously crucial, by shipping almost everything in from the outside, investment is ultimately not sustainable. And in fact, in fact it's probably contributing to dependency on foreign aid and undermining the overall missions of the international community. So as an early driver of economic growth, investments in the domestic marketplace, particularly early on, can create and restore livelihoods while contributing to a number of important other, uh, other objectives and help facilitate the achievement of the wider international community's work, including reducing the risk of renewed conflict. So just to give an example on that, if you take the case of Liberia, for example, where tremendous amounts of human and financial capital have been spent to date, um, but yet here we are and we have an unemployment rate that's hovering around 80%. We have a UN that's drawing down and that's incredibly worried about the economy and the country's reliance on a number of the different kinds of um, goods and services that they provide. You know, what does it say? Liberia is doing okay, but what does it say about that country's ability to really absorb shocks as it goes forward? <coughs> it's really quite vulnerable. Um, so there's the opportunity, ultimately. Instead, if the international community were buying local wherever possible and investing in entrepreneurship, they could be, in essence, sort of doubling their impact, not only meeting their objectives in terms of project delivery, but creating jobs and capacity and growing a class of people who are engaged in rebuilding their country, and in essence, buying stock in its stability, which is also critical. It's a win, 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 as far as we're concerned. So this is what we do. Our services are designed to address the key challenges that have prevented greater amounts of local sourcing in these countries, and to facilitate business relationships between buyers and local suppliers. Oops. So I mentioned a few of the, sorry, this is some of the translation thing here, I shouldn't look this ominous, don't worry, but <laughs> I mentioned a few of the, the challenges that, you know, why isn't this happening more, why isn't there greater local sourcing on the ground, because it seems to make a lot of sense. Um, but there is, and it's not just a failure of the international community. Um, there are problems in which prevent this. There's information asymmetry. Um, this is certainly one of the key barriers, and it's so basic. I mean, it's difficult accessing and finding reliable information on the local marketplace. You can imagine you enter a, you know, a crisis or a post-crisis economy, and local marketplace, there's assumptions that are made that businesses just don't exi exist. 
it's the, the economy is ruptured, it's fractured, you know, we've got to ship everything in from the outside. So those assumptions are made that we have to get on with business, and so we bypass the local economy in doing that. At the same time, information is lacking on the side of suppliers. They don't know how to access business opportunities that may exist. Um, they're often buried on websites, they're in English, not in their local language, and so that barrier just bumps up against itself. Uh, capacity is clearly an issue. In a ruptured market and where there's new and surviving businesses, many of them, of course, are going to struggle to meet the standard and expectations that the international community requires to do business with them. And at the same time, the international community is required to meet certain specifications in order to be able to deliver their products. So that's another one. There's human resources and tools needed to address gaps in the market, which simply just aren't available. Um, often the international community requires large scales and large scale needs within tight timelines. So this greatly limits expansion of local business as they are expected to cash manage projects given the limited access to capital. Um, there's corruption, that's clearly a problem. And then there's a long legacy of using foreign um, resources and organizations that that cycle just hasn't been broken. We're just used to using foreign organizations and companies because it's easy, it's fast. Um, and then policies more broadly often don't support local sourcing. They actually uh, require you to source from your home country in, uh, in many cases. Um, but despite all of these challenges, so this kind of also does sound a little bit ominous as even I'm going through them and I know them so well myself, why would we try and do this? Um, and it's because despite these challenges, businesses are going to enter the market regardless of whether or not they're enabling sports or the international community is supporting them. But their ability to do that is incredibly limited based on the resources that are within their range. But just to give you a couple of like quick stories um, about how we know that, these are just assumptions that we're making. Uh, one of the ways that we got our, our, our organization started is that our founder was working in Timor-Leste, and he was uh, working with the UN, and he watched his landlord collect rent and use that rent from the conflict, so this is, this is very early on, um, to refurbish burnt out minibuses. And he started doing that slowly. You know, the money for economic recovery had not arrived, so there's nothing really going on in that regard. And he watched this landlord become the biggest employer in his neighborhood. And about two years later, when the money actually did arrive for economic recovery objectives, not only was he the biggest employer in his neighborhood, he also had a fleet of buses that was servicing the country. So it's, it's sort of amazing. And that, that was just through his own ingenuity. And that doesn't necessarily exist everywhere. But when you think about providing support that can help nurture that, we can certainly expand it. Uh, in Herat, in Afghanistan, there was a, a, a small family who decided they wanted to start a little import motorcycle business. And they started that business, it was going well, but it was quite tiny, you know, they had like 10, 10 people in the company. So they decided they wanted to expand it. <coughs> and, but they didn't have the actual manufacturing capacity to expand it because what they wanted to do was really build their own three-wheeled three -wheeled rickshaws. So they saved up money and they sent one of the siblings off to China. The, the sibling went to China, they actually videotaped um, the assembly process for these uh, rickshaws, brought that videotape back, and then hired mechanics in which and trained them based on this process. And that company, that little company that was 15 people, went to 200 people in a matter of five years. And so that again just tells you that that wasn't with international support. So that just tells you again, you know, what the potential and the possibility is out there. So now getting on to how we actually do this. How do we address these challenges? So PNT uh, provides a set of products and services that, again, are really looking to excel, accelerate the emergence of these entrepreneurs and facilitate <coughs> these business relationships. And again, we've honed in on sort of the key barriers to local sourcing. And while this is our core model, our core services, we're always looking to improve these. You know, we're doing that through end user feedback and wanting to innovate and improve wherever we possibly can. But this is a core model that generally gets replicated across the countries that we operate in, with of course contextual tweaks 
where they're necessary depending on the makeup of the country, the size of the economy, customs and traditions. So one of the things that we do is we, we provide these online business directories. And there's a couple of uh, things that I'll tell you about the directories. So I talked about early on that one of the key challenges was just simply the opaqueness of the market, the lack of access to information, the concern about corruption and not knowing what credible uh, businesses actually exist out there. And so what our teams do is we have verification teams that actually go out and verify the private sector. And when I say verify the private sector, what they do is they meet with businesses, they actually survey them, they make sure they meet certain criteria, and if they do, that they're, for example, that they're licensed with the appropriate authorities and that they're registered appropriately. And once we are able to determine that they actually do meet that criteria, they can get registered with PDT for their services. And part of that registration means that we generate a profile on them and we put it up on that country's online business directory that's accessible to anyone and then searchable by sector and location. And then every six months, because of how dynamic and fluid these environments are, we actually have call center teams that reach out to each one of those businesses to re-verify their information. And then that information gets populated, um, you know, because otherwise people won't use the resource. And just to give you a sense of the size and scale of that, it, just in Afghanistan alone, we work with more than 7,000 businesses across 26 sectors. So that's sort of the, one of the core, um, one of the core services that our that our projects operate. And then we do matchmaking. And matchmaking is really looking for those bigger, higher opportunities to fill demand within the, the local marketplace by buyers. And so we have matchmaking teams that really do demand analysis, understand what the demands are, and are able to match those with local supply. And so it goes beyond having this supplier directory online where you can search by sector and location to find you know, the 2,000 water pumps that you may be looking for. You may have a deadline, a much bigger scale procurement that you need to fulfill. And my matchmaking teams will actually go out and work to identify the, business that, the businesses that can fulfill that. Just to give you a quick example there, in Haiti, uh, after the catastrophic earthquake, you know, we had an, a, another catastrophe there with the cholera epidemic. And when that happened, the greatest preventative measure around the cholera was soap, a bar of soap. And so we found out quite quickly that the big agencies were shipping in all of their soap. I mean, you know, and I'm not talking about hundreds of thousands of bars, millions and millions of bars of soap. But our team on the ground in Haiti was, was able to identify 11 companies who were able to provide that soap, three of which were local manufacturers. And so we were able to match make this business relationship, and it ended up resulting in several contracts that redirected $1 million into the global economy, along with all the other great socio-economic -impa impacts that go along with that too when you think about Haitians helping Haitians in such a crisis. Um, so that's an example of our matchmaking. Our tender distribution, it's pretty self-explanatory. We collect tenders from the international community, buyers that exist in these environments, and then we make them available to local suppliers. As I said earlier on, local suppliers often can't identify these opportunities. Once they do identify them, you know, the competition pro process has progressed in a way where they can no longer be a viable candidate. So we want to try and get them that information as quickly as we can. So we do that through uh, SMS platforms, so we can start, uh, target specific sectors based on what the business opportunity is. Um, and we do that by email and tender distribution points. Then we provide training. Um, training is obviously key in, in being able to build up the capacity of local suppliers to understand contracting processes. What do they need to do in order to be able to effectively compete for business? What are the expectations of a more formal economy? Many just don't know, but they want to know. And they get in line for our trainings. Our teams on the ground in the countries we operate in offer these every week. Most of them are basic trainings, but we also are starting to offer more technical trainings as well. And then we do market research, which is essential to the work that we do. Again, we want to be able to provide these kinds of contacts very little data is available, and so we want to, and, and it basically makes buyers that are operating in them more risk averse to operating in them, and so we want to provide them as much information as we can about the private sector, given our far reach within it. Um, and that's everything from sectoral studies, to looking at job creation, to looking at quality of life improvements, to looking at how barriers to entry in these markets have been decreased. Uh, and again, these are the surveys that my, uh, our call centers carry out on a very, very routine basis. And then we make those metrics and those reports very, very widely available in the marketplace. 
And then just lastly, the obvious piece of advocacy that has to be done. Um, advocacy is crucial and we are always working to not only work on these fast wins where we know that we can facilitate these business relationships, but some of those bigger wins like actually changing policy that would allow for much more greater engagement. And so we've had some wins around that, helping to influence host nation first policies like Afghan first where the U.S. government is now required to go to the Afghan marketplace first before, as long as they meet certain standards, before they go offshore. So now I just want to take you briefly um, to our theory of change diagram. I took you <coughs> to the services first because I just wanted to give you a lay of the land quickly. Um, but then I wanted to tell you how this sort of evolved to you know, how we affect change, how we believe we influence change. And this is something that obviously came over time in research and understanding of um, our buyers and suppliers and the kinds of countries that we're operating in. And mainly, it also, it also brings back to the sort of points that I was making at the beginning about what we're trying to achieve, which are these black circles, which aren't so easy to read down here, but these black circles at the bottom. And then our services are at the top. This red arrow going down, it just summarizes thematically which each of those, what each of those horizontal rows talks about. So basically what we're doing, again, by those services that I just outlined, is we're addressing those barriers and challenges to local procurement. That is leading to a change in market behavior. That starts to build the market. That leads to employment, investment, and capacity, and that really underpins a functioning economy and wider stability. Um, and you can see through here, we actually have a, a very cool sort of HTML version of this where it kind of lights up the paths that are most, <laughs> most relevant to each other. Um, but you can see through here, so beyond our services, you can see sort of the skills of the local suppliers to respond to tenders is increased. Access to barriers to international contracts is reduced. Practical other barriers to buying local, et cetera, et cetera. Then you're getting into a more healthy, sustainable marketplace. More money goes into goes to local businesses. This inspires confidence and more investment. Business capacity obviously uh, increases. You get more jobs created, which is crucial. And then you get these wider, really important outcomes. Um, one thing I want to be able to make sure to clarify, though, on this is that this is not obviously, um, we do not obviously believe that by procuring locally and local sourcing that we're going to suddenly create these self-sustaining, independent, healthy, thriving economies. Mm -hmm. There are other factors that are at play here, other dynamics within these machines that also contribute to that. We just think that this local sourcing piece is crucial and it's often bypassed and the evidence shows that, um, that the positive wins are huge. So really, we also need traditional aid playing part of this, national government policy, and hopefully foreign direct, uh, foreign direct investment, which will be attracted as you know, some of these particularly bottom level changes start to come into play. So where do we operate? Um, team members in Afghanistan. <coughs> we operate in Afghanistan, Haiti, Liberia, and Timor-Leste. We've been in Afghanistan since 2006, early 2006, and uh, that work started based on rigorous research that we undertook, uh, looking at, in particular, the United Nations Department of Peacekeeping Operations and its economic footprint in the host countries it was operating in. And it, based on the findings, which local procurement was the big win, the really big fast win, that's how we piloted our work first in Afghanistan, then really scaled it there, moved on to some of these other countries. We're hoping to be in South Sudan in early 2012. So how do we measure our impact? Uh, impact is incredibly important to us, and so metrics are incredibly important to us. We are less process driven and very impact driven. Um, so we do that through the jobs that we create, the dollars that we facilitate into local economies. So this is happening just through rigorous economic research and analysis, quality of life improvements I think I mentioned before, barriers to market entry being uh, decreased, number of businesses registered and trained, and influence over policy change. There are many others, but these are some of the sort of the bigger key ones. So what are our key results to date? Um, 
again, I just stuck to some hot, uh, some sort of the, uh, the bigger highlights. But today, through these like very simple services that we provide, none of it is, is really brain science. We've helped um, more than 12,000 local businesses. That's how many businesses are. It's about 14 actually, 14,000 businesses now are actually registered with us and receiving our services. We have almost 2,000 businesses trained, formally trained. We have uh, helped redirect over $1 billion into the economies of Afghanistan, Haiti, and Timor. And we have created an estimated 100,000 jobs. And we've helped with the adoption of host nation first policies that really sort of help facilitate that broader change. And so, just to wrap up, um, oh, something happened again. <laughs> so it's say challenges and opportunities. Okay. Um, <laughs> but that could really be a fill in the blank that could not be good. Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, so some of the challenges, I'm just gonna actually pull it up here because I can't see it as well on this one because I think it got cut off. Um, Yeah, so some of the challenges um, are, yes, definitely increasing access to information and sharing information. Um, policy and practice. Policy and practice, I mentioned, is a huge issue, but it, it's not to get stopped by policy and practice. There's always ways to innovate around that. You still want to push those efforts forward, but also there's, there's always opportunities to get around that and innovate. Uh, setting clear targets, I think, is absolutely essential. We see too many organizations, we were guilty of it early on as well, setting these broad general targets that no one's accountable for, essentially, at the end of the day, and how do you really know whether or not you're measuring impact? Which leads into, something screwy happened with this slide, which leads, leads into actually measuring impact, not process. That's not to say that process isn't important, because of course you know when you've got an a great outcome and a, a really strong impact. You want to know what your process is and get it down. But too often, again, we're so hyper-focused on process-oriented results as opposed to looking at real impact. So on the process side, for example, we will look at you know how many mosquito nets were distributed, but we don't actually measure how many cases of malaria were prevented or how many people actually use those mosquito nets. So thinking about that side of it. Um, partner where possible, I think a number of people have mentioned that, just in not cre recreating the wheel. Um, there's always partnerships available out <coughs> there. Feedback is extraordinarily helpful. You always want to be reaching your end, end users. I mean, for us, we learn something new every day. We have a list of en enhancements that's 100 pages long based on the great feedback that we get from our end users. Uh, for us, again, local, 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 but I think that's a theme that's come up, up across a number of the different presentations, that local engagement is so important in this kind of work. Um, it doesn't always have to be done from the outside, and, and the wins around that um, are obviously huge. Uh, make sure it's realistic. We, too, are incredibly excited about the use of SMS. We use it not only to send out data, we do push-pull surveys. Um, you know, we do uh, alerts through um, SMS. It's a fantastic resource, but also, again, sometimes we get lost in the fact that, uh-oh, we're sending it to a rural community where everyone's illiterate, even though they have a cell phone. So, you know, it's important to make sure that we're keeping things realistic. And then just lastly, not on here, but on my slide, um, is sharing successes. Um, I think this is something that really gets lost. Um, even when you're so busy and you're starting something new and you've got a great idea, you know, you're so invested in that particular thing. And so sharing successes doesn't always seem important, but it is extraordinarily important for what you're trying to do and impact. But also, again, it's, it's another way of being able to exchange ideas and partner and connect with people. So thank you very much.